This talk is about how we moved the core of our traffic management product from an Nginx-based proxy core over to Envoy over the course of about six months, starting last, late last summer and finalizing very late last year, beginning of this year. So background, I was at Twitter from 2009 to 12 when Twitter was moving a lot of things off the Rails monolith onto JVM services, and then from big JVM services into smaller JVM services, and a lot of what became sort of proto-cloud native. If you look at what Twitter was doing in 2012 or so, it looks a lot like cloud native today, minus all the nice things like Kubernetes, Envoy, Linkerd, all this other stuff that came out um, after, which we would have loved to use, that we kind of built ourselves and did early versions of. I left Twitter in 2012 and went to Nest and led server site engineering there and uh, didn't get to use a lot of the tools that we'd built at Twitter because they didn't quite exist yet and started Turbine Labs really with a goal of productizing a lot of those practices in ways that other people could use. Um, this is about migrations and so we want to kind of set the stage here for why would you even do a migration? These things often fail. They're really hard. Um, this talk was rated as advanced skill level, which in hindsight I was a little nervous about because technically this stuff isn't, it's not rocket science. Uh, socially, migrations are really hard to pull off. And having gone through a bunch of pretty big ones, they're difficult not in the same way that doing like distributed consensus is hard, but they are difficult in the sense that you have to get a lot of people to buy into a lot of stuff. You have to de-risk a lot of things. Um, and from a process perspective and a political perspective, they're much more difficult than a lot of the deeper technical challenges, I think. So why would you do them? They are one of the only ways to scalably get uh, tech debt fixed. And so Will Larson, who's a manager at Stripe, has a great post that uh, lays out the case that most systems are really only designed to grow in order of magnitude beyond their initial design constraints. And then you have to start looking at other systems to get you to that next level. Um, and a lot of people don't do that soon enough and end up kind of grinding out that last little bit and it's painful. So this talk is about making your Envoy migration easier, but a lot of the practices and the principles apply to general migrations. And one of the nice things about Envoy as a fluid proxy in front of things is it makes all kinds of migrations easier. It's an extra benefit. A disclaimer, I didn't do much of the work outlined here. Um, my name's not on here, uh, but I'm here to more or less do a readout and analysis of all the stuff that our great engineers did along the way. Um, Turbine Labs, the company we started after coming out of Twitter and Nest, is a, a traffic management application that's designed to give a lot of the practices we built at Twitter and put those into the hands of, of the wider engineering population. Proxies are the technical core of that, and so we're in a pretty unique position as being a vendor selling stuff, but also a consumer of proxy tech, and kind of connoisseurs of the differences between HA Proxy, Nginx, Envoy, various things. So, interesting place to be. We have lots of opinions. Uh, this Envoy migration sums up a lot of them. So, step one here, and sort of, kind of since the inception of the company, was we are going to use a proxy technology that exists. At the time, in late 2015, the reasonable options were Nginx and HA Proxy. Um, we built a product on top of Nginx. This is our early plan, straight out of 2015. Uh, and comments on this slide, at the very bottom, this is kind of a train wreck. And it was really, so about the slide, this is, throughout this talk, I'm not saying Nginx is a bad piece of software by any means, it served us very well. This was mostly about the graphics uh, that I did. Uh, but also, as we'll go through the kind of rough spots of the architecture we built, it was, it was pretty high friction for us trying to deal with the cloud native type, dynamic, high cardinality, frequently changing environment. This is the initial product we built. And you'll notice it looks almost exactly the same as this, but we had somebody better do pictures. So it's not a train wreck-ish, circles. Um, and this worked, so we built a lot of stuff on Nginx, and we got the system working. It was great, you could do blue-green deploys, canaries, um, header-based routing, it was super cool. So why move? And I think if you're looking at proxies today, a lot of you have, who's using Nginx on Kubernetes? Hands? Good, good, HA proxy? Do you say it HA proxy or HA proxy? Show of hands, no, okay. Um, I don't know how to pronounce it. 
So there's a bunch of things we looked at in our architecture as we were considering this move to Envoy. Um, at about the same time we started our company, Matt Klein had left Twitter to go to Lyft, and one of his first tasks we knew was to build a proxy to help Lyft manage traffic internally. And so it's a weird sort of parallel story arc there. That we were talking with uh, Pete, their VP of engineering, and Matt, and knew that they were going to build a thing that would likely be better suited for our needs at Nginx. Unfortunately, it didn't exist. And being venture funded, we needed to build a thing, so we chose Nginx. And here's where we ended up. The, the first thing is that the base routing primitives are not, are not the greatest. So Nginx has locations, you can kind of route traffic, but this notion of probabilistic releases, like 5% of traffic to a thing and 95% to the other, and gradually shift that across, like a sliding blue-green deploy, like wasn't in there. And extending it meant shipping a custom module. So that's like strike one. We had to ship a custom Nginx build to get our functionality out to people, which from an adoption perspective is kind of a scary thing. The other thing is that the upstream constructs they had weren't super full featured in that a lot of systems expect an upstream to really be a host, a port, and a wait. And that's good for, for some things, uh, but with modern systems you get a lot of labels and metadata and tags, et cetera, on instances. So you know more about that workload than just where it lives. And we wanted to be able to route based on the version of software deployed or what Git branch it came from or whether this was a QA or a production system. And so we had to add that to our custom module as well. The other thing is that even after we'd added all that to the custom module, configuration was still file-based. And so for us, shipping a product and using it internally both involved a lot of just copying files all over the place. And for the most part, this works. But when you have enough of them, you'll end up with like a file didn't get pushed in one box and things are weird and we don't know why until you go check some of the files and find out there's an outlier and have to go fix it. The other thing is that every time that config changes, you have to reload the process. And Nginx does a great job on reloads, but it's still the case that you end up with worker drift and things draining connections, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a little, little clunky. Another thing is that observability was important for us from the get-go. When you're trying to do routing across multiple versions of stuff, you want to know what the behavior differences are between multiple versions of stuff. And so getting the good stats out of any proxy really at that time meant having a log tailor that would parse the access logs and give you the stats and send them off to your system so you could parse them. And so having these like, necessary agents co-located with Nginx meant that we had to ship this whole ball of stuff um, out to all of our customers and, and internally too. It wasn't a simple like lightweight sidecar. Here's a whole proxy operationalized in this like very non-idiomatic Docker single process system. And like you should just install this, it'll just work, don't worry about it. Um, it did work, but people still worried about it. Uh, and then the last limitation was Nginx was really, at the time, built for TCP load balancing and HTTP 1, which was, you know, that covers the majority of traffic. HTTP 2 in 2015 was becoming a thing. gRPC was very nascent, but we thought, going forward, that people would be skewing much more heavily to gRPC. We'd seen the benefits of similar systems at Twitter and thought that we should have support for that. And Nginx, at the time, only had kind of HTTP2 support. So HTTP2 in the front, fan out to HTTP1 in the back, not the greatest for end-to-end -end, uh, connections across a deep service RPC chain. So, this is our, I realize we're not in Sweden. Uh, but this is an old Twitter inside joke for, for the proxy. Um, call up Envoy, see what we can do to help here. So this is what we actually can build with Envoy. And so this is a much cleaner break of there's Envoy and there's management stuff. And we'll go through the reasons why, why that's possible and why that's a better solution, um, both for us as a vendor, for people as a consumer, for operators, you know, for everybody, everybody concerned. So, the benefits we looked at um, as Envoy had, well, these are the benefits Envoy has now. We'll go through how we got there. Uh, more sophisticated routing. When you're working in a service mesh style environment or even at the edge, there's just a lot more you can do now with modern systems that have tags, labels, more information about workloads than you had before. Changes are easier to get in. Uh, this is like a non-functional feature. 
but our ability to get changes made directly to Envoy has been much better than our ability to push a patch to Nginx. Um, and it's not really a knock on Nginx so much, but it's an older project. There's more inertia there. It's hard to make fundamental changes. Um, upstream definitions are much, much richer. Envoy's notion of an endpoint has arbitrary gRPC structs, so you can shove whatever you want in there as an endpoint provider, which is great. The whole config via service design is pretty novel for a proxy. So for people not as familiar with Envoy, you can still configure it with files, but it also defines gRPC interfaces that will deliver config. And so you implement the service, you point Envoy at it, and it will say, hey, give me my clusters, give me my listeners, give me my routes, and if they change, let me know. And so your entire Envoy fleet is connecting to a management service getting config, which means you have a central point of control for Envoy config changes, which is great. The other thing that's pretty recent is the ability to stream logs over gRPC as well. So instead of having to run a log tailor, you implement a log sync, and you can do all your processing centralized as well. And there's a wide range of protocols supported, so not just HTTP 1 through 2, I guess is all they're up to now. Um, but there's Mongo, Redis, um, Dynamo, there's a couple of others, and adding new, uh, new protocols is pretty straightforward. So this is all good, and we looked in, in midsummer, and I was like, sounds great. But features aren't necessarily enough to kind of bet a company or a production site on. So you get into like the non-functional requirements of a migration. I'm going to do this thing. Technically, it seems better. There's a lot of features I want. But if it's only going to be up 50% of the time, that's not great. And if it's not supported, that's not great. And so we went through these as the, as the qualitative aspects of an Envoy migration. So how supported is it? Is it lightweight? If we're going to have people deploy this as sidecars, it's important. Is it fast enough? Um, if you're going to introduce this as a hop between every service call, you don't want it to be super slow. And then predictable latency is also pretty important. So we had experience at Twitter working with proxies written on the JVM. And for the most part, performance is very good. But you have surprising outliers when there's full GCs and stuff like that that can be not good for your long tail latency. So with Envoy now, uh, I looked at the last release, so between 1.6 and 1.5 on Envoy. So 71 committers on the project. Um, it's maintained by pretty big companies and us. Uh, so Lyft, Google, Apple, and us with 11 people. It's kind of an outlier. Um, and so these aren't people that commit. These are people who are maintainers of the project. 50% of the commits, actually greater than 50%, came from people not in those orgs. So there's a pretty diverse set of people committing. The other nice thing about usage is that it's not just use at Lyft. It's fairly unique that it sprang from Lyft open sourced already in full production. There was no real incubation period where it wasn't prod ready. But the things Google is doing with Envoy are very different from a use case perspective than Lyft. Um, and like what Verizon is doing with it is very different than what Lyft is using it for. So there's a pretty broad set of use cases it's applied to that made us more comfortable. It was a general purpose effective proxy for a variety of workloads that we'd be delivering. Um, so if anybody follows Matt, the Envoy author on Twitter, you know he has strong opinions about C++ still being cool enough to write software in. Um, it's controversial, apparently. Uh, so, I mean, the benefit C++ gives Envoy, like, not directly, you can write bad code in any language, but it has a pretty small footprint resource-wise that makes it very suitable for running in a sidecar manner. Uh, there's no garbage collection, which means it has a very predictable latency profile. And it's fast enough. Like, if you stack it up against Nginx or HA proxy now, it's not going to win a benchmark that you can drive, but for the flexibility and other like non-functional or even other functional requirements it has, it's fast enough to, to trade off for, for the additional management capabilities you get. Um, and so our process last summer was really watching that curve of support, um, community, speed, footprint, and saying, like, is this the right time for us to move from Nginx to Envoy? And that all converged um, mid to late last summer. We decided to make the port. So, um, Let's do a migration. And so we won't get into like technical like commit by commit aspects of this migration. Um, but we'll go through, go through this. So, so things you consider after you've decided this is a good idea. Um, so 
Nginx and HAProxy have a lot of features. They've been around for a long time. And you probably don't use all of them. But you need to make sure that there's, uh, there's some way for you to ensure that like, your Envoy deploy is going to match up acceptably with your Nginx and HAProxy deploy. And the way we did that is we started off with a higher level of abstraction for config. And so instead of our source of truth being nginx.conf, distributed everywhere, we had a data model that let us define the attributes we needed in an nginx.conf file, and that allowed us to come up with an equivalent Envoy config and, and match those things up. And so when we were rolled out, we knew that Envoy would behave identically to the nginx-based system that was there before. The other thing is there just may be straight feature gaps that you can't, you can't address. And so you really have, have three choices. Uh, contribute to core, highly recommended. Uh, push the stuff back to the open source project so everybody, everybody wins. Um, Envoy has a really extensible filter mechanism, so very much in the vein of like working with, uh, with Netty or other filter-based network pipelines, you can implement your own stuff pretty easily there. It has Lua support now, so you can script it up for prototypes. Um, and then the higher level abstraction thing we did. And our approach was when we found gaps, we just worked to commit them back to open source Envoy. Um, which was great. Uh, it was pretty easy to get pull requests through. There's high code review standards, but that's a good thing, not a bad thing. And so we committed pretty, pretty substantial things, like the ability to build on a Mac, not in a Docker container, which is super useful. Um, subset load balancing, arbitrary metadata on endpoints. Uh, some pretty big things we got in place, I think, fairly quickly. The next thing there, operational parity is definitely a thing. I think for a lot of migrations, people go through and it's like, I have this running on my laptop. This is fantastic. We should just go to prod. And the more seasoned slash older people on the team will be like, you know how you're going to deal with logs, right? You're like, oh, yeah, uh, that's a thing. Um, and so Envoy's pretty good about most of this stuff, like getting logs out, pretty standard. Metrics, it has an admin server that gives you a pretty wider range of stats. If you're used to dealing with um, some of the other proxies and trying to get internal proxy stats out, Envoy is, is much more approachable. Let to figure out how to do alerting. Um, packaging and deployment are still pretty new. Uh, for Envoy, there's a Docker image and not much else, but it's not that hard to, to roll your own at this point. Um, and the process management is a thing, too, that it doesn't come with like a built-in systemd integration. It's just a Docker container, so you'll have to figure that out, too. Um, None of this is super hard, but definitely things to think about when you're rolling out. The other thing before the migration is there's a temptation, especially if you haven't done too many of these, like, I'm pretty sure this new thing's gonna work. So let's not plan for failure, let's plan for success. And when I flip the switch, it's gonna be great. Then it isn't. Um, so one of the things we really pioneered at Twitter was incremental rollout of all the things, uh, because they never worked. So sliders are better than switches in almost all cases when you're thinking about this migration. So how can I do X percent of this thing as a test? Um, how will I roll it back quickly when it fails? Uh, how easy is it and how many people can do the ramp up, ramp down? These are all things to, to plan in. The other thing that is, is really good to know up front, so what stats am I gonna look at? Or like what, what KPIs am I gonna look at to know that this migration is going well? Uh, for a proxy, that's probably things like latency, like resource usage, like error rate. Um, and it's not that you shouldn't, you know, it's not just about collecting those things and observing them, but having, like, having fallback points of if latency gets this bad, we will roll this thing back. It's much easier to know that stuff up front <clears throat> than during the migration when people are worried and emotions run a little hotter and you have to have an argument with somebody to roll it back because you think 50 milliseconds is fine and they think it should be 30. Uh, so having those set points defined up front makes the whole process quite a bit smoother. Hopefully you don't have to ramp down, but it's good to know when you would otherwise. Um, so with all that in place, our first step, and also on the incremental note, was we didn't go sort of full envoy from the beginning. Like if you look at this picture of phase one, it just looks exactly like the old picture we had. It's just instead of the management agent, we implement an XDS server. And instead of, well, we still had a log parser. So there's a new log parser that parses Envoy logs, but it's still a log parser. The nice thing about this is operationally, it is the same thing. There's a ball of a container we ship. This one has Envoy. The last one had Nginx. Nobody knew the difference. Um, and it was really just a bump on the container version. Like, change your deployment to use this new thing, and you'll have Envoy. Ta-da! 
And uh, this worked. Uh, after a lot of work along these things. So our process kind of beginning to end to get to phase one was a lot of like filling uh, the feature gaps we had. And this wasn't that Envoy just had a poor feature set, it's just that we built a lot of stuff into Nginx that we didn't want to give up. So we kind of looked at what all had we added, what did Envoy have, and there were the beginnings of a lot of those features that we just fleshed out. Um, implementing an XDS service, which has been uh, something we've worked on for, for quite a long time, because uh, there's several of the XDS services and uh, varying levels of difficulty in implementing them. Updating the log parser. This was like surprisingly a reasonable amount of work. I don't remember why, but it was. Um, packaging deployment. So this is a lot of Nginx has a pretty you know straightforward like configure make. We've entered it. We built a binary. We shoved it into a container. With Envoy, it is easiest, we found, to get the shipped Envoy container, yank the binary out of it, plop it into your container, and go. Or you can just extend, extend their container. This one actually wasn't too bad. We did a lot of testing. Um, the fun thing about proxies is they are very hard to test with a live traffic workload, because <clears throat> unless you're doing really sophisticated capture replay of production traffic at scale, the best place to test these things is actually in production, um, which can be nerve-wracking. But um, slider speed switches, be prepared to roll back. We didn't actually have to with this. Uh, we did a lot of testing outside production, and it happened to work, but we were prepared. After that, canary new proxies. So we had an ELB for our site. We have a bunch of containers behind that that were running Nginx. We upgraded one of them to run Envoy looked at stats across the whole fleet, see if latency is the same, resource usage is the same, error rates are the same, um, run all of our qualification tests with our app to make sure behavior was the same, the 400s for a request are still 400s, 404s are still 404s, so it's all good, and then fully roll out new proxies. This whole process took us, like from the time we had, well from the time we started to the time we rolled out was probably five months. Um, a lot of that was spent in steps one and two, um, six and seven were pretty smooth. I think we kept their canary running for a week or so. Um, there were really no issues. Then we decided to fully roll them out. That was great. It's been very smooth. Um, and then once we had that transparent swap in place, like the ergonomics of deploy were exactly the same with Nginx and HAProxy, then we took that next step of taking advantage of the XDS services to really fully separate that management plane from Envoy itself. So this is where we ended up, and we are much, much happier. Uh, the Envoy we, we run now, or that we, we can run, at, you know, run for other people, is just stock, open source, bring your own, point it at our thing, and it'll get itself configured. And this means that we don't have to ship our own container of Envoy. We don't have to worry about patches. Somebody else has to, uh, which is better for us, somebody else worries about it. Um, but it also means that people can use their own build pipeline, their own packaging, their own deployment, their own et cetera, and just point at a management server and get benefits. The other thing that we've used that's pretty new is the uh, access log service, which is great. So we don't even have to have a telemetry sidecar on Envoy. We just say, hey, ship your access logs to us. We'll take that and forward it to StatsD or Influx or Prometheus or whatever. And you don't have to worry about anything other than just deploying Envoy and getting it configured properly. This has been really great. Really great. Um, and that's where we are today. Fully deployed Envoy, XDS. It's really good. Um, so here's lessons learned after, after six months of this stuff. And I would say six months of this one, uh, at Twitter for a long time, our job was basically doing these things over and over. Uh, and there was like a, a little checklist of here's how we're going to move some slice of the Rails monolith onto the JVM. And so these, these things, like these approaches, apply to lots of different kinds of migrations, the same approach. De-risk, incremental, know when you're going to have to roll back, know that you're going to know when you have to roll back, um, and just be prepared to do that several times along the way. Uh, the nice thing is if you get that as a common practice, then the refactoring of the system becomes quicker. And I think your developer productivity and the ability you're able to get out of your system increases. You don't accrue all that friction along the way of just trying to stay on the same system because it would be really, really scary to move off it. Um, 
the other thing we learned here, like the third bullet, cluster management and listener management for Envoy was interesting for us, where cluster management is almost always, you have some sort of truth, some yeah, source of truth that knows about clusters and endpoints, and you're really just mapping that from whatever the native um, implementation is into Envoy speak. So in Kubernetes, you do kube control get pods. You can convert that to an EDS response pretty easily, uh, and it's really just glue code. When you want to do listener and route management, you have to come up with some other canonical store of how you want layer seven traffic flowing across your system, and that's a whole other project. And so we see a lot of people coming to Envoy, implement their EDS CDS service, be like, this is great, and then kind of stopping because the next step is real hard, which I understand, but that's something that provides a ton of benefit on top of just dynamic service discovery. It's a little frustrating. So, None of this is rocket science. Like none of this is like deep system stuff. You don't have to read like ACM papers, really. Um, but it's a long project. It's a high risk project. It's hard to keep people excited along the way to let you keep doing the thing to roll it out. And a lot of migration is going to get bogged down three months in with management. There's somebody else saying like I don't know that we're actually ever going to finish this, and I don't see the benefits if we do. So. Um, they tend to be risky for different reasons. And so that's another reason that like, incrementalism, showing like, quick wins, the ability that you're still moving forward is great. The other thing is a lot of the stuff we built along the way I think are pretty useful outside our project. So we'll actually be open sourcing this ball of management bastion um, over the next few weeks. So this is a drop-in you know, implementation of CDS and EDS that will bridge console, EC2, all the things there, into cluster discovery so you don't have to write your own if you're using those environments. It'll also read from JSON or YAML files, uh, which is probably easier than writing your own CDS service. It has an ALS implementation that forwards to the big metrics backends. Um, yeah, that's all the, all the big ones, I think. And then it will set up a simple LDS and RDS config to give you like a fully working Envoy. If this LDS and RDS isn't sophisticated enough, you can use a combination of static and dynamic config to do customization. And then the upgrade path to our product, which does much more sophisticated routing and listener management, is just provide an API key and it'll use us as the canonical store instead of, uh, instead of LDS and RDS. The other thing we'll open source is what we call Envoy Simple. Um, right now to run Envoy, you need a bootstrap config that you provide, so you almost necessarily have to stand up your own container to get it configured. This does a very simple Go template file that lets you configure the stuff via environment variables and gets you to head start on rolling out an Envoy managed by XDS in production. Um, so point at XDS, configure the admin server, configure the log level and Go. Um, and so this is a pretty dramatic speed up from trying to figure out the Envoy packaging stuff. And we're excited about this. So it's not quite ready yet. We were hoping it would be. Uh, but in the next couple of weeks, this, this bow should be available. And I think a pretty dramatic speed up for people looking to roll out Envoy in their environments. So uh, here's a little bit of info on me. Um, Envoy project, uh, you can come by our booth. Happy to talk about Envoy rollouts, migrations, uh, whatever. Any questions? How are we doing on time? Six minutes for questions. Anybody? There's, I think there's a mic in the middle. I can repeat the question and yell if you really don't want to get up. Uh, yeah, so is there any particular feature of Envoy that uh, helps you with, with rolling out changes into production? So it depends on the type of change. Um, short answer, yes. Why not? Um, there are a wide variety of production changes that Envoy helps uh, roll out. We've seen people use it for migrating from system A to B, where A is usually not Kubernetes and B is Kubernetes. Uh, but being able to load up endpoints that span multiple different runtimes and being able to gradually shift traffic from like an EC2 console runtime over into Kubernetes is really useful. Um, we use it for our own software releases to always do blue-green deploys for those, like incremental blue-green. Uh, so yes, there, there's a lot of different ways to smooth that out. Yes? Uh, how are you on uh, using the Envoy health check versus ah. Kubernetes? 
Uh, so, so the question is, how are you on using Envoy Health Checks versus Kubernetes Liveness Probes? Um, that is like a whole talk. Uh, I'm not a big believer in health checks in general, um, which is probably a pretty hot take. The, the downside with health checks is that they tend to never be full fidelity. So a health check is like, hey, I'm listening on a port. I can accept traffic, which is cool, but does not mean that the service behind it is working at all. And so Envoy supports some pretty interesting liveness constructs internally. Like if it starts receiving uh, error responses from, a, from an endpoint, it will eject it from the pool and then retry again later to see if it's healthy. And so I think in most cases I'm more in favor of not even using the health checks at the cluster level on Envoy, but using outlier detection and its um, sort of built-in version of health. Other questions? It's hard to see back there. Just a question, uh, does Envoy support initiating the SSL handshakes from a sub-URL pattern? SSL handshakes from a sub-URL? Yes, like initiate a uh, layer four limitation like client-side certificates for a particular URL. I don't know if it does it for a particular URL. It definitely supports MTLS for an entire listener but I'm not sure if it does it for a sub-URL. Uh, I would have to check. Because as far as I've seen, uh, only Apache supports this now. That sounds entirely and, plausible. And it's quite a legacy but heavily used feature just to protect the sub. Interesting. Interesting. I, I don't know. Thanks. Yes. Would there be any reason to use Nginx over Envoy for new services? Um, no regrets. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so Envoy does not do static file serving right now, which is, which is a big thing that Nginx does very well at. Um, there's also, I think, a larger overall list of modules for Nginx, particularly around mail handling and some other things. Uh, so I think short answer is yes, there are cases where you would want to use Nginx. I think Envoy is catching up very rapidly on almost all fronts and surpassing it on a number of others. Um, so I think those cases will become more rare. UDP? Yeah, yeah, U UDP from, from the front. Uh, there's a ticket open for UDP support and there's a lot of discussion there, uh, but yes. Anything else? Yes? You briefly mentioned testing in production. Have you ever had to do some? Was, I, so the question is, I briefly mentioned test in production, have I ever had to do some? Our original product was very much a test in production product. Uh, we are strong believers in test and prod. Um, and it, that's like a whole other, like probably conference, but, uh, the, our core thesis is that going to production is another form of test. And like, if test in production makes you feel dirty, then using validation in production is probably a little better, but it's the same thing. Like you're deploying new code, the chance of there being bugs in it is greater than zero, and you, so you should tool up to be able to detect those and find them and respond to them. And a lot of the things like the incremental blue-green release are exactly a test and prod. I'm going to put a thing out, and it's not that I just leave it. I want to observe metrics, like the differences between a test and a control. And if the test looks good relative to the control, then I can proceed. If it doesn't, then I turn it off. So, so very much believer in test and prod. One more minute. Anybody? Yes. Yes, so the, the question is, I said it was fast enough, and how does it compare to other proxies? I think the general stance in the Envoy uh, Slack, whenever it's come up, is that there's no good standard benchmark to use right now, which may be, I don't know. Um, there have not been people complaining. I think the generally accepted delta is somewhere around 10%, but it's hard to come up with a benchmark for a given workload at you know, a, a client or production site um, to do an apples to apples comparison. Um, you know, eBay uses it at the edge now for a lot of their ingress traffic. They're kind of a big deal. Um, so I think it works. 
Um, and I think that there was no real inclination to look at replacing like their hardware load balancers with something different. So I think that's a pretty big like vote of confidence. Um, and there's other companies that are doing like pretty high scale things where they care about density. Um, from a sidecar perspective, it's interesting that fast enough is really about if you're running as a sidecar on a Docker container, you are in no danger of saturating a 10 gig network interface. Like, it's just not going to happen. So, trying to eke all the performance out of Envoy to be able to serve as the core of a hardware appliance is probably not worthwhile there. And we're up. All right, thank you, everybody. Uh, Come, come by the booth, hit me up on Twitter or whatever, I'm always happy to talk about this stuff.